uh, to be here. And I'm really happy to talk with you about our success in, uh, in Maryland and how that can be replicated uh, here, uh, here in, in New Zealand. I am a lucky man. Uh, I have a wife and two beautiful sons that enjoy my life. In addition, my work has been public health advocacy. For the last 30 years, I have worked primarily in my state of Maryland, but also across the United States to improve public health, to reduce uh, underage drinking and teen smoking, reduce gun violence and, 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 and childhood obesity, and to expand health care. And that is what I have been doing. And in this work over the last um, 30 years, I've learned two very important things. First is that there are solutions to these problems that we face, these what many people call intractable problems of, of underage drinking and teen smoking and in America so much gun violence. There are solutions. People in buildings such as this across the world have studied these problems and studied solutions and come up uh, with, with, uh, with solutions. Second thing I've learned is that the vast majority of Marylanders in my state, and I know Americans, and I believe people in New Zealand and across the world want these solutions to become reality. They support these uh, proposals, but not everyone. And uh, in my work, I've come across that minority of people who are loud and strongly oppose what we do. In my own community in Baltimore, in uh, Maryland, I went to get their support a few years ago for a measure to reduce gun violence, and it was strongly supported. And a few years later, I went to that same community group to get their support for increasing the tobacco tax to reduce teen smoking. And this really big guy in the front of the audience said, aren't you the guy who came after my guns? Now you're trying to take away my cigarettes. Next thing I know, you come after my ham. Well, I told him we would leave his ham alone. I didn't tell him I was a vegetarian because he probably would have shot me. But we calmed him down, and the group supported our, our proposal. He was loud and obnoxious, but he and people like him are not the reason that we don't have success many times. They're, they're, they're opposed to us, but they are not the ones who block our measures. We are blocked by powerful vested interests who make a profit off of sales of alcohol to kids, off of people smoking, and too many guns on the street, the alcohol lobby, the tobacco lobby. They have a lot of power. And in my state of Maryland, they were able to block for 40 years the enactment of an increase in the alcohol tax. In 1972, an alcohol tax increase happened. And then again, not again for another 40 years because of the power of the alcohol lobby. Well, in Maryland, we have come up with a six-step program, which has been able over these last 20 years to defeat vested interest opposition and create some powerful success in Maryland that has caused us to be one of the lowest smoking rates in the country and to enact an alcohol tax, which has resulted in a dramatic drop in drunk driving, and in gonorrhea rates because of less bad sex decisions by kids who are drunk. And these successes happened because we enacted laws, alcohol tax increase, tobacco tax increases, and other measures over the objections of these powerful vested interests. So what I'd like to talk with you today is how we did it. But I want to start with a, 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 a two-minute video which describes this process in a way that I think it, it, people will understand quickly, and then we'll talk more about the details. So, uh, Nikki, can you play the video? While grassroots campaigns need to be strategic, they definitely don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a proven path for success already being used to transform public will into political power across the nation, and it's explained in the book, The DeMarco Factor. It's a multi-year process, but we can summarize the main points in under two minutes. Step one. Create an evidence-based policy plan. This is where you work with local experts and grassroots organizations to develop a watertight, proven policy solution. Don't skip this step. This research sets you up for success throughout your campaign. Next, test the plan with a high-quality poll. If you're going to get groups and politicians to sign on to something, you'd better make sure it moves voters first. And don't skimp on polling. Reliable results from a respected firm get you the credibility you need. Now you're ready to build a coalition, create a resolution for groups to endorse, and work hard to get lots of important organizations signed on. Got your coalition? 
It's time to bring on the media. The more media, the better, because media coverage builds public support for your cause and motivates your supporters. The fifth step is to make your policy into an election issue. This is when you leverage your coalition's strength to make candidates for office endorse your resolution. Then, let the voters know which candidates have endorsed it and which have not. And lastly, go win in the legislature. Because your powerful coalition got the candidates for office to endorse your cause, you begin the next legislative session with the support of a strong number of legislators committed to get the job done. You've built a powerful grassroots movement and are in a prime position for your policy solution to pass. Ready to learn more? Visit healthcareforall.com slash six steps. So let me start by emphasizing that before we implemented this six-step program, the word in our state capital was that it was impossible. It was impossible to raise the tobacco tax or raise the alcohol tax over the objections of these powerful best interests, the tobacco lobby and the alcohol lobby. Again, on the alcohol tax, it had been raised in 1972, but for 40 years, the alcohol lobby was able to prevent the tax from being raised again, even though advocates tried and tried again uh, to raise it. So we instituted this six-step uh, program. And what I'd like to do is describe it to you, and you have it in front of you, each of the six steps. And if you have any questions along the way, raise your hand, and we'll talk about it, answer your questions or comments along the way, because I don't want you to forget your questions. But think about the importance of a plan. Think about the importance of having these six steps and implementing them to overcome these powerful vested interest opponents. So step one is your foundation, is evidence to support what you believe is the best way to deal with the problem. If the problem you're trying to address is too much underage drinking and alcohol abuse, when you talk with experts, they will tell you, as they told us, the best way to deal with that problem is by increasing the alcohol tax. That's the best way to reduce underage drinking and alcohol abuse and to provide money for needed uh, public health programs. So when we wanted to address these issues in Maryland, we turned to the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, which is one of the most renowned public health schools in the world. And Professor David Jernigan was at that school, had studied these issues for many years. And he helped us put together an analysis showing how an alcohol tax would help Marylanders. Yes, there have been studies across the country generally saying alcohol tax increases will reduce underage drinking, but we wanted a study specifically to Maryland, and that's what he provided for us. And it was a terrific report which really documented that if you increase the alcohol tax, you will reduce drunk driving, gonorrhea rates, and other problems caused by alcohol, and bring money to the state that can be used for public health measures. And as I said earlier, this came to be true after we passed uh, the alcohol tax. Our goal, once we had that report, was to get the message out to the public of Maryland. I had one quibble with his initial draft. I didn't like the title. It was too academic. Alcohol taxes might benefit some people sometimes, something like that. I wanted a stronger title, like alcohol taxes save lives. And he said that was not right for an academic report, which I, I trust. I, you know, David Jernigan is a guru. He's a wonderful man. But so he, we came to a compromise, something like potential health benefits of an alcohol tax increase, which was better, but it didn't matter because when I released the report, my press release at the top said alcohol taxes save lives. That was our lesson learned from that report. He did another tremendous report also, which debunked the main arguments that the alcohol industry made against our proposal, which was one, that it would lose jobs, and two, that everybody would go to a nearby state to get their alcohol, what they call a cross-border issue, which is not a problem for New Zealand, right? I mean, they're not going to go across the Tasman Sea to Australia. But in Maryland, it was a serious issue because we border a lot of other states and jurisdictions. But David's second report very carefully and systematically showed how that wouldn't happen in any significant amount and that we'd create jobs, not lose jobs. So these two reports form the foundation of our going forward with our, our proposal. And we released them to the public in a press conference, and we also shared these results with key advocates in the, in, in the advocacy field and key legislative leaders in what our parliament is called the General Assembly 
of Maryland. And so many, even of our public health leaders who are pushing for an alcohol tax, did not focus on the fact that it would reduce underage drinking by itself without programs benefiting from the money. And it was very important that this report got that message out. The leader of our, one of our um, houses of the General Assembly, the House Delegates, a speaker, was convinced by this report that this uh, a policy made sense. He wasn't sure before that that alcohol taxes were a good idea. Once he saw David's report, he became a believer. So that's very, very important to do step one well. This is the policy. This is how it works. Second, it's also very important to do public opinion research polling to test whether the people of your jurisdiction here, the country of New Zealand, support this proposal. In Maryland, there had been polling done showing that generally Marylanders supported alcohol and tobacco taxes, but I wanted to delve a little deeper. How strongly did they support this measure? What I wanted to know, and what frankly the politicians want to know is, is it a voting issue? Will voters tend to support somebody who supports an alcohol tax? In Maryland, and it may be true here, there's a general view that it's bad politics to support a tax. Nobody likes taxes, so it, 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 it kind of seems to be the conventional wisdom that it's politics, bad politics to support a tax. We want to know, is that true for an alcohol tax? So we commissioned the poll, which number one found strong support generally for an alcohol tax increase. Then we asked three questions, which I hard, hardly recommend that you do here in New Zealand. Number one question, in the next election, for whom are you going to vote? And we have two parties in America, in the United States, Democrats and Republicans. You're going to vote for a Democrat or Republican for our General Assembly. And when you, we asked it that way, we're a generally Democratic state. It came out about Democrat ahead by about 20 points. Question number two, if the Democrat supports the alcohol tax proposal and the Republican opposes it, for whom are you going to vote? Tremendous shift toward the Democrat. So now the Democrat was up by about 30 or 40 points. Really significant shift. But then we ask, what if the Republican supports it and the Democrat opposes it? Tremendous shift to the Republican. These three questions answered our, what we wanted to know. It showed us that the voters of Maryland supported alcohol tax so much that they would make it a voting issue and vote for a candidate who supports an alcohol tax, not against that candidate, and against a candidate who opposes an alcohol tax. There are two main reasons for this. One is in Maryland and America, in, in the United States, and I don't know if it's for sure in New Zealand, 40% of people don't drink any alcohol at all, teetotalers like myself. Another 30% drink moderately, one glass of wine a, a night or something like that. So about 70% or more of the people drink little or no alcohol so that an alcohol tax would have very little impact on them, $10 a year at most. A third of the people drink so much that an alcohol tax would impact them. And they're the people, frankly, we want to have drink less. But the vast majority of people wouldn't feel themselves adversely impacted by an alcohol tax as they would by, say, a sales tax or a gasoline tax. So um, that's number one. And number two, people have this instinctive understanding that that's a way to reduce uh, underage drinking and alcohol abuse. So the people of Maryland strongly support it. Steps one and two made our second general message. Our first general message is alcohol taxes save lives. Our second message is alcohol taxes are good policy and good politics. Because frankly, many of the legislators aren't thinking first and foremost about how to save lives. They're thinking about how to save their own necks, how to get reelected or get elected for the first time. So having that second step is very, very important uh, to moving forward. And again, like in step one, we held a press conference to announce these results. And if we had simply announced 60% of Marylanders support an alcohol tax, that would have been a big yawn for the media and the public. So what? But to say that a significant number of voters would have sw would switch their allegiance based on who supports an alcohol tax to be for the person supporting alcohol tax, that was big news, which made front page in our papers and got the attention of the policymakers. What I want to emphasize is when you do this kind of polling, if you find the results that we found, then you go ahead with the rest of these steps. If you don't find the results, you can't do that. 
this whole campaign is based on the fact that in Maryland, the vast majority of people support an alcohol tax and would make it a voting issue. There may be another issue, for example, maybe a soda tax or some other tax, which is strong public health support for that, but I don't know if voters would make an issue of it. And if they don't, you have to educate the people about why, why they should. For New Zealand, I strongly recommend doing a tax like this, a poll like this to find out, do the people of New Zealand, like the people of Maryland, want an alcohol tax so much that they'll make it a voting issue? Once you've done steps one, two, you, sw you go to step three. Step three is where you uh, transform this public will, which is out there, into political power. And as you saw in the video clip, there's a book uh, called The DeMarco Factor, subtitled Transforming Public Will into Political Power, which I highly recommend. I didn't write it, so I don't make any money off it. But it's a really good book which describes how these processes that I'm talking about works. But the public will is there. That's what our poll showed us. But it's not mobilized. It's not really behind something yet. And that's what you have to do in step three. Step three is when you reach those people and really bring them together. How do you do that? I believe the best way is by reaching out to and uh, working with organizations that have clout in your jurisdiction and getting them behind you and using their appeal to their members to mobilize the people of your country or state or, or city. We do that by putting together, first and foremost, a one-page document for them to sign. We call a resolution. And that resolution is, is, is what we use to build our powerful coalition. And to me, it's very, very important that that be one page. You're going to be talking with very busy people, and if you give them a 10-page document, you don't get anywhere. And some of my friends say, what about two pages? I don't like two pages either. I don't want them to have to turn over. I want them to see everything they need to know on that one page. Yes, you have the backup material. Somebody asks you a question, is that really true? They can look at your website. You can give them the backup material. But you want it to be written so that the person who's very busy running a big organization, you get five minutes with that person, they read that document and are able to say, well, I want to go further with this or, or not. And writing that document is where you make some of the critical decisions for your campaign, like how much should the tax increase be? We originally wanted it to be a dime a drink because our excise tax was very, very low. Is that what it should be for New Zealand? You want to propose something reasonable and something feasible and something that will accomplish the goal of reducing underage drinking and, and alcohol abuse and bringing in sufficient money. And since it brings in money, you have to think about where the money should go. Should it go all to alcohol and tobacco, alcohol and tobacco cessation and, and treatment and prevention? Should it go to drug treatment? Should it go to mental health and disabilities like we did in Maryland? Should it go to help hospitals? Should it go to help the public health system? You need to think about those uh, uh, items very, very carefully and make sure you have in the room with you the right people who will help you write that document. The way to think about it is if you write the document, it goes public and somebody objects, if you have to listen to that objection, that person should have been in the room. So think hard about who needs to be in that room to write that document with you. Once you've written the document, then you get all the signatures on it. And this is very, very important and was the core of our three or four year campaign to enact the alcohol tax. We spent a long time working with organizations to get their endorsement. The kind of organizations we started with are, of course, organizations, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, other groups that really focus on alcohol. But you've got to quickly go beyond that. You've got to go to the broader public. Yes, ma'am. Yes, that, that's a good point. The question was essentially, you know, there are people in the room to write it and then the broader population to get signatures. You can't have everybody in, in that room. And, that's, and people are, most people running organizations don't want to be anyway. They've got a lot on their plate. It's just a real fundamental strategic decision you have to make based on where the money goes and who needs to be in the room, who has to be able to be with you to write that document. And, and, and again, you have to think about whose objection you would have to listen to if they objected afterwards. Clearly, the key groups in your country working on the alcohol issue should be in that room. And also, if the money is going to a particular institution like the healthcare system, the people involved in the healthcare system need to be in that room. So these are all decisions you make. And I have found 
that you can have thoughts in your head that are nice, but it's not real until you put it on paper. And putting these ideas on paper forces you to make a lot of these very important decisions. And after you've done that, then all those people in the room will sign, hopefully, and then you go broadly. In Maryland, we focused on organizations with a lot of clout, organizations so that when policymakers read the list of endorsers, they'll say, wow, I better stand up and take notice. We have an organization in Maryland called the AARP. It's National Organization, American Association for Retired Persons. And they have a lot of people in Maryland who belong to them, about 800,000 of our 5 million people. Getting them to sign on was very, very important. Similarly, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the main African-American organization in Maryland, we got their endorsement. They were very important. We have a lot of key faith organizations in Maryland with a lot of clout. We got their support. On and on, we built support. One type of organization we focused a lot on was the Maryland Association of Student Councils. We're trying to reduce, reduce underage drinking, so having the student councils on board was very, very helpful. And whenever one of these major organizations signed on with us, we held a press conference, we let the public know that, they're, they're, that these groups are supportive, and we did it around the state. So we would hold press conferences from one end of the state to the other, announcing that key groups uh, have endorsed. You have a big country, but really your population is around the same as Marylanders, as Maryland is. And we also have our population concentrated in one part of the state. So the, around Auckland, I understand it's about a third of the population of New Zealand. So you could do a lot by media attention here in Auckland to these groups. So don't forget uh, the, rest of, the rest of the state. So you spread the word about this support. I'll never forget when we had endorsement from our major faith leaders. We had great uh, media coverage, including an icon on TV that night that said something like God versus tobacco. Hard, hard to beat that. So, so the endorsement of these organizations can really help to build your, 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 public, uh, your public support. And that leads to step four, the media. Very, very important to use the media to the hilt. 